so glad to be here this morning at Amazing Grace Baptist Church. Uh, we're, we're your future missionaries, hopefully, Lord willing, to the Navajo Indians. And uh, my wife here is uh, April, if you stand up. Uh, this is my wife, April. She is a Navajo Indian, and so uh, we're going back to her people. Uh, I met April in, at West Coast Baptist College in 2004. Uh, I thought she was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, I, I smiled at her. She smiled back at me, and it turned out we liked each other. <laughs> I had no idea at that moment that I'd ever be going on to, to be a missionary to her people. It wasn't until many years later, after we had even been married, and been married for, for about uh, three or four years, that uh, God called us to be missionaries. And uh, now we're on the way. Uh, we have about 30% of our support raised. We're going, to a, we're going to a dark place. The Navajo Nation is a dark place. When I say dark, you mean there's no lights there? Well, there are some people that don't have electricity. But it's dark because it's a place that the gospel is not really penetrated too deeply in. See, the gospel is a light, and that's why Jesus said, let your light so shine before men, they will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. There's a lot of people in the reservation that are dark, they're in darkness because they're without the gospel of Christ. And so we want to go there and, and spread the gospel light and, and share with, with people how they can be saved. A lot of people struggle with addictions and, and with, uh, with um, methamphetamines, um, with, dr with drugs, alcohol. That's not the greatest problem. Drugs and alcohol is not the greatest problem. The greatest problem is people that are without Jesus Christ. And when my, my, just like when I got saved, God transformed my life. That these people, will keep, if they get saved, their life will be transformed by the power of God. And some of those things that they were uh, relying on to comfort them, like maybe people get, a lot of people are poor, you know, people are poor, they turn to alcohol to try to make them feel better. I mean, but when you have Christ in your heart, you have the joy of the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's going to that's gonna encourage you. That's, they're not going to be relying on alcohol anymore because they have Jesus. And so that's what we want to do. We want to share the gospel in a dark place. And uh, if you just watch this video, and I trust it will be a blessing to you. The is located in the southwest region of the United States. It's part of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. It's a very large piece of land about the size of West Virginia. It features arid deserts, alpine forests, mesas, and mountains reaching as high as 10,500 feet. The Navajo people are the largest American Indian tribe with over 300,000 Navajos. To be considered Navajo by the tribe, you have to be at least one quarter Navajo. The Navajo people are for the most part soft-spoken and quiet and keep to themselves. They are family-oriented and they take care of their elders. Let's not forget that the Navajo people are Americans. They served their country valiantly in modern conflicts, and especially in World War II. Thanks to the Navajo code talkers who spoke the Navajo language and code, they were able to transmit thousands of encrypted messages with 100% accuracy and faster than any machine at the time could. The Navajo people living on the reservation today struggle with high unemployment and poverty. And when I say high, I don't mean 14 or 15%. Unemployment is estimated at 42% but the actual numbers are even higher. There are some significant financial needs, but by far the greatest need is the spiritual need. The Navajo Reservation is a dark place that needs the light of the gospel. But God is at work and missionaries on the field are reporting that now the Navajo people are more open to the gospel than ever have been. Listen to the testimony of Ryan Nez, a Navajo man that's preparing for the ministry and missionary Joel Haynes. There are over 250,000 people on this reservation and just a handful of Bible-believing Baptist churches. We, we, need, we need churches to be started. We need messages to be spread across this Navajo reservation about the, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's that we, we, we need pastors, we need missionaries, we need laborers to be out here and to, to give the gospel to, to, to the Navajo people. There are many, many Navajo people dying and going to hell each and every day. And we want to be that roadblock to hell. We want this to be preached. We want this Bible to be, to be distributed. We want this Bible to be, to be given to our people so they can, they can know Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
My name's Joel Haynes. I have the privilege of being a missionary out here on the Navajo Indian Reservation, what I believe to be one of the most exciting places on the face of the earth where we see God doing some tremendous works. You know, I had the privilege of growing up here on the reservation among our native people as a missionary kid. And I remember back in those days just starting out, uh, you know, going out knocking doors with dad. And it seemed like we were banging our head against the wall just to get someone to listen to the gospel much less actually accept Christ as their Savior and show back up at church. Uh, we'd walk away singing victory in Jesus if somebody just so much as listened to us. Praise God for the work, and we're excited for the McDaniels to come and be a part of it. I thank you for considering the McDaniel family to the Navajo Nation. I feel they are very worthy of your support. They have served East Mesa Baptist Church well for the last four years. We'll miss them, but we know God has a greater calling for them to reach the Navajo people. They have served in the areas of Sunday school and Awana, children's church, song leading, nursery. They're fine servants of the Lord. Please consider the McDaniel family to add to your missions family, and God bless you. I'm John McDaniel. My family and I are going to go to the Navajo Reservation to reach the Navajo people. In 2000, I graduated from high school in Southern California and enlisted in the United States Navy. When I was stationed overseas in Sicily, I heard the gospel for the first time and got saved and began growing as a Christian young man. And that is when I heard about Bible college. I got out of the Navy in 2004 to attend West Coast Baptist College. I met my wife April, we dated throughout college, and in 2008 we were married on the Navajo Indian Reservation at the Nosh Chitty Baptist Church, where the Lord is opening the door for us to go. In 2011, the Lord led us to Mesa, Arizona where we have had the opportunity to serve at the East Mesa Baptist Church. I've been a deacon and a ministry intern, and it's been a very good experience for me. In June of 2014, we were approved as BIMI missionaries. Our goal is to get to the field as soon as possible. The Great Commission is not an option. It's an obligation to get the gospel message into all the world. We have an awesome opportunity to reach this generation of Navajos with the gospel while the harvest is ripe, and we need your prayers and support so we can labor in the harvest. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Is your heart stirred yet? Amen. Every time I get a chance to see uh, a foreign field, see where people uh, need the gospel, and even just driving in the streets of Wichita, amen, people need the gospel everywhere, amen, so, uh, but it stirs my heart to see, like I said, I got called to the mission field today, but the Lord told me to stay again, so I, I'm not, you know, <laughs> going, I'm staying here, but I believe every person ought to struggle with the idea of being a missionary, amen, every Christian ought to have the, the burden, amen, now God may not call you, Amen. But at least have a burden to reach people. Amen. And so watching that, I hope that your heart was stirred to realize that there's more than just Wichita that needs the gospel. Amen. There's people that are lost without hope. And uh, in America, and, and, and the Navajo Indian Reservation is in America, but it's, it's, a, different, it's a different culture. But in where we live, in, in, the play, in Wichita and, and, and all around America where we have our Western culture, churches are everywhere. Amen. You drive down the street. I looked uh, in the, the business church business directory this last week, and there's, there's over 60 churches in Wichita, some more. I, I didn't even count. I, I stopped counting. There's so many churches, amen, but so few churches that preach the gospel. Right. Right. So few churches that preach how that Jesus Christ can give them a home in heaven. And there's even fewer on the Indian reservations. Amen. Think about how few there is that really preach the truth of God's Word. Right. In America, there's that many less in these, in these foreign places, these mission fields, the Indian reservations. Amen. So pray for the missionaries as they go. Pray for the work that God's doing. Amen. I know some missionaries on the, on the Navajo Indian Reservation right now, and it's a tough work. Amen. It's a labor. The Bible calls it a labor, a harvest. Amen. It takes work. You've got to get out there, plow the field. You've got to spread the gospel. Amen. And sometimes you don't see fruit right away, 
It takes a while, amen, but God is working, amen. Hutchinson, or uh, in Hutchinson, it was the same way. Dad, you know, it took a while. Dad got out there and, and knocked doors, invited people to church, and the Lord blessed. Wichita is going to be the same way, amen. We have to work here as they'll have to work there. Man, we've got to work here, giving the gospel, spreading the good news, handing out tracts, inviting people to church, and watching God bless. Amen. Amen. But if we don't give God something to bless, then God can't bless. Amen. You've got to give God something to bless. Amen. You've got to say, God, you can do it, so here's my labor, and God will bless it. Amen. So I'm excited, so pray for them. Be back tonight. He's going to show the video again, and uh, we're going to get to see that, and then he's going to preach to us, and so praise the Lord for that. But amen, we're going to get into the message this morning, so I'm excited. Now that everybody's laid back, relaxed, I'm going to ask you to stand up, amen, stretch a little bit. We're going to read the Bible, read God's Word, turn to the book of Luke, amen. Turn to the book of Luke. We're going to go to Luke chapter 23 this morning. Luke chapter 23, amen. Luke chapter 23. Now is the most important time of the service, amen. All that we've done up till now has been great, but it prepares your heart for this moment, amen, for when we preach the Word of God. So I ask that as we do this, uh, as the Word of God's preached, that you would uh, ask the Lord to open your heart. Ask the Lord to help you, amen. There we go. woo -hoo. Let everything be done, amen, decently in order. So we're doing it. We're putting everything away. We're getting it set up, amen. So that way there's nothing to distract you, amen. Because we knew if we leave it down, everybody would be distracted. You know, somebody would eventually come up here and just put it up for me. So we do it now, get it out of the way, amen. Now, thank the Lord for Brother Wes. I did not know how to set up the projector, so he walked in and I said, Hey, how do we do this? <laughs> Praise the Lord that somebody knows how. Amen. Thank the Lord for people that serve the Lord, yes. amen, yes. And, and help in areas where the pastor is clueless, amen. Brother Ken and I were talking about that, about plants, and uh, he was like, Normally, he has a green thumb. I said, well, mine is black as can be, brother. I don't know nothing about plants, and so they help decorating, do things. And so what a blessing it is, amen, to have people serve. Anyway, so we're going to get in Luke chapter 23. I ask that you uh, listen to the message this morning. Allow God to open your heart in a special way as we uh, read the Word of God and we get into the morning service. Luke chapter 23, we're going to start, and let me get here, I'm sorry, to my, I lost my place there. We're going to start here, verse, um, verse 39. Luke chapter 23, verse number 39. The Bible says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly? For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I'd like to preach to you a message this morning entitled, How a Thief Got God's Attention. How a Thief Got God's Attention. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. And Lord, I know that you can do a great and a mighty work. Holy Spirit, you promised in the Word of God that where two or three are gathered in, in your name, that you'd be in the midst. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd come down and be with us in the morning service, Lord, as we take time now to dwell upon the Word of God, to dwell upon the truths from your Word that you would speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd convict every heart in the room for whatever the need is that's needed today. Lord, if anybody doesn't know that if they die that they'd go to heaven, they don't know that they're born again, may they get that settled today. Holy Spirit, if there are Christians in the room that have burdens, that have needs, that need you to answer, I pray that, Lord, through the message, that you would encourage them and give them direction, Lord, at what they need to do. Lord, thank you, Lord, so much for the opportunity to preach God's Word. I ask, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you'd fill me and use me in a special and a mighty way to meet the needs, whatever that there is. And, and Heavenly Father, at the end of the service, we'll give you the, all the honor and the glory and the praise for what you do. But just ask that you'd open every heart, open the ears, Open the minds of every individual, Lord. May we receive the truth from God's Word. May we be better Christians because of it. And again, if somebody's not saved, may, Lord, they get that settled today. May they, may, may they find out how that Jesus, you can give them a home in heaven. And may they trust you today. We love you. We thank you. Ask all these things, ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. How a thief got God's attention. Many of you are familiar with how Jesus was crucified and how Jesus went to an old rugged cross 
Amen. And He paid for the sin of the world. But as I was reading this in my Bible reading this last week, the Lord uh, struck my heart with a truth of how that Jesus, uh, at, while He was on the cross, a thief was able to get His attention. Jesus is God. Amen. The God of the world. Amen. He stepped out into nothing and made everything that you see. What a great God. And Jesus, while He was paying for yours and my sin, doing the greatest work that ever could be done, and that's giving Himself as a sacrifice for us, shedding, shedding every drop of blood He had in His body so that you and I could have a home in heaven. While He had you on His mind on the cross, while nails were in His hands, nails were in His feet, a crown of thorns on His head, stripped before the world, a thief got His attention. I want you to think about what took place on the cross. Jesus was in agony, the Bible says, in the garden. And He was praying in great drops of blood, the Bible says, is what He sweat. He had so much going on. Every emotion that a man's ever felt was going on at that moment. Every physical pain that you could ever endure, Jesus was enduring at that moment. Every uh, weight of sin that you'll ever face, Jesus faced. The Bible says that, Christ, that God put on Christ the sin of the world. Every weight, every burden that you have ever felt, Jesus felt. And what a Savior. Everything that you'll ever experience, Jesus experienced. Amen. Every problem that you'll ever occur, Jesus. The Bible says He is not a, he's not a God that is not touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows what we go through. Amen. He felt it himself. But amidst all of this, amidst everything going on and how the devil was trying to prevent the greatest act of love from being carried out, a simple thief, for a brief moment in time, got God's attention. I believe that Jesus could have just ignored. He was taking care of the sin of the world. The greatest act of love as we described, he was doing. But a thief was able to turn and ask God a favor, ask God a request. And the God of heaven turned and looked at him and answered. I believe you're here this morning because you want to get a hold of God. I believe you're here this morning because you desire to know God. I believe you're here this morning because you too want God's attention. But maybe some are here this morning that maybe just your circumstances brought you. Maybe you just came because your family came. Maybe you don't really care about God because there were two thieves that day. Both of them didn't realize that they would hang next to the God of, Cal to the, God of the universe on Calvary. Their circumstances brought them face to face with the God of eternity. One of them didn't really care. You've come this morning to an old-fashioned independent Baptist church that loves the Lord, loves people, loves souls. You've come face to face with God today and you didn't even know it. And you have a decision to make. Maybe you came because your spouse is here. Maybe you came to fulfill a weekly duty to God. Maybe you don't know why you came. You just know God wants you here. But whatever the reason is, you've come face to face with God this morning. And God has an answer for you. And you can get God's attention. Everyone in this room today can get God's attention right now and get an answer from God. Regardless of what you're here for, regardless of your social status, regardless of your financial status, regardless of everything else, Jesus is interested in you this morning. Amen. And He wants to give you an answer. And you can get God's attention. God is... Amen. Dealing with the world right now. The universe. God runs everything. But God will take a moment of His time to answer you today. Let me keep going here. You can get a hold of God's attention. But let me show you how. I believe from, the, from what we've seen today, what we've read, I believe that we can take some things about this thief and we can learn how that we as Christians, and maybe you're lost today, but you can get a hold of God's attention. But before I show you that, I believe that some of us here need to make a decision. We need to make a decision about salvation. 
Some of, some of you here need to make a decision to trust Jesus today. God's been dealing with your heart. God's been dealing with you about your soul. God's been dealing with you about eternity. And like the thieves on the cross, some of you have, become, have come face to face with the God of eternity and need to make a decision today. Maybe some of you here and face a burden, a trial, you need to make a decision today. Like the thief to get a hold of God's attention. Amen. Let's look in our Bibles this morning and see some truths that I believe that can help us to get God's attention. If you want it. Now, like I said, there's two on the cross that in our story. One got God's attention, and notice the other, Jesus never answered. You realize this morning there are some in today that God won't answer. There are some this morning that God may not give you an answer. And I believe there's a reason why. Just like God did not answer the other thief, I believe that God won't answer some in the room. Because there are requirements to get a hold of God's attention. Amen. There are things that we need to understand that if we're going to get a hold of God this morning, we've got to take care of. Amen. What is it that determines who gets God's attention? What is it in our lives that determines whether or not God will answer? Let me show you this morning. Look there as our, in our text, verse 39. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? Boy, what words of wisdom, even from a thief. I believe the first thing, if you want to get God's attention today, you're going to have to have a fear of God. One of the greatest problems we have in America and why God is cursing America, I believe today, is because there's a lack of a fear of God. Yes. So many people are quick to rail on God like this thief is. We're so quick to rail on God and blame God for everything. Listen, God won't answer. Amen. God's not going to answer the questions that you have if you're quick to rail on Him and blame God and ask. Notice what that thief asked. He said, if... How many people in America are so quick to say, well, if God? Amen. We don't want to trust God by faith. We doubt and we say, well, you know what? If God will do this, then maybe I will. How many people say if? Well, if God. Well, and all this was was not a sincere question. But it was an accusation and a doubt on Jesus' divinity. Right. This thief did not believe that Jesus was the king of the Jews. He just wanted to get out of trouble. He just wanted to get out of having to pay for what he did. So he says, well, if you're really God, why don't you save yourself and us? He didn't really believe that Jesus was God. He just heard what everybody else was saying. And he said, well, if you really are, why don't you prove it? How many of us today come to church and we say, if you're really God, why don't you prove it? If you're there, how many atheists will make the same claim? Well, if God's really there, then strike me dead. I believe that God doesn't answer because God, like the thief, doesn't answer a prideful attitude. God doesn't ha have to because God will answer one day. Yeah. God's coming back. And God will give a final answer that no man can rebuke. But God's not going to waste his time on silly questions. Yeah. Amen. We can't get a hold of God, even as Christians, if we don't have a fear of God. And I'm not just talking about a fear as a trembling, although we should be knowing who God is. But a fear as a respect also knowing that he is the Savior of the world. Notice that thief, he rebuked him and said, Dost not thou fear God? Boy, he knew he was wrong, but he still had a respect for God. Amen. We're going to fail every day here. Every one of us are going to fail in this room. But never get away from a respect for God. Amen. I believe God won't answer that. Let me show you some verses real quick. Luke chapter 12, verse number 5. 
Luke chapter 12, verse number 5. This is why we ought to fear. Jesus himself says, But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. See, that thief didn't know that when he railed on Jesus, that Jesus was the one that has the power to cast into hell. Jesus has the one to save you also from that hell. We fear more man than we do God. In America, we have more respect for a football player that walks into a room than we do at the house of God for Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you ought not to fear man, because what can man really do to you? But God has the power to cast into hell. Fear ye him. Boy, America's out of whack. We'll fear Donald Trump because he's got money. We'll fear somebody that threatens us with money and say, I'll take everything you have. We fear that. We'll fear the king. We'll fear the queen of England and give her respect but we'll come and use God's name in vain. God says, fear ye him. Let's go to Psalms chapter 33, verse number 18. A couple verses I want to show you. Psalms chapter 33, verse number 18. The Bible says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. You want to get God's attention? Have a fear of God. Look what he says. God's eye is upon them that fear him. If you have a fear of God this morning, then God's eye is on you. God watches those that have a respect for who God is. And if you don't, then the Bible says God's eye is not on you. Amen. Psalms 36 verse 1. The Bible says, The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. David said when he looked out and saw the wicked and saw what they did, their transgressions, then he knew there's no fear of God. In America, how true is that? You look at America and you see the sin, the homosexuality, the adultery, the fornication, everything that goes on. You know why that is? There's no fear of God before their eyes. But I believe this can be true of a Christian. You can get to a point to where there's no fear of God in your eyes. You'll do whatever you really want and not care. Christians can be that way. I've met pastors that are that way. You get to where, even as a man of God, there's no fear anymore. No respect for God. And they'll commit some horrible sin and God will judge. There's no fear. How sad. Look verse 2. Of Psalms 36, it says, For he flattereth himself in his own eyes, until his iniquity be found to be hateful. Those that don't fear God, they flatter themselves. In their own eyes, they think they're okay. But in God's eyes, it's a whole other matter. Psalms 89, verse number 7, last verse. Psalms 89, verse number 7. The Bible says this, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. God says he should be greatly feared even among the assembly of the saints. In the house of God, amongst us as brothers and sisters of Christ, there must be a fear of God before us, knowing who God is and what God can do. God can keep our church alive, amen. But God also has the power to make it die. We have to maintain a fear of God. That's why it's, I believe it's important to teach our children to respect God. Because God forbid we raise a generation with no fear of God. Yes. Then there'll be no church. Right. Teach your children to have a respect for God Almighty. Amen. Starts in the house of God. Teach your children to have a respect for the things of God. Have a respect for God's house. Have a respect for God's word. All of those things are important. 
You think, well, what's the big deal? You're teaching them to have a respect for God. Listen to me. You have to start in God's house to teach them that belongs to God. That belongs to God. That belongs to God. It's not ours, it's God's. Amen. When we come, my dad, and I, my dad always taught um, as, as, young, as, young, as, uh, as young kids, he would say, now son, if you walk around and you see trash on the floor, pick that up. This is God's house. And I, we would walk around and we would pick things up. And he'd say, uh, he'd tell us, don't do that. That's God's. And my dad taught me at an early age, and I'm so thankful because I see friends and peers my age that come and destroy the house of God. And they're a mess. I believe it starts with training with what God has given to us and teaching our children to fear what belongs to God and that will translate to a fear of God Himself. Amen. We need to have a fear of God. Christian today, have a fear of God. Lost person today, have a fear of God because God can cast us into hell at any moment. It's by the grace of God you lived and you woke up this morning. It's by the grace of God you got to breathe another breath. We ought to have a fear of God. Proverbs 16, 6, we won't go there. But it talks about how that for the fear of God, men depart from evil. If America would get a fear of God, I believe there wouldn't be the evil that we have. But I believe we would take that verse and encourage ourselves that in our church... We maintain a fear of God, and evil will stay at that back door and never enter. But the moment we as a church lose a fear for God Almighty, you can promise yourself sin will be in our midst. What else is required to get God's attention? Can I tell you today from our text, go back, Luke chapter 23, what else is required to get God's attention? What else did this thief do? that got God to answer. He said, number one, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. He recognized who he was. I believe if you want to get a hold of God this morning, you've got to recognize who you are in the sight of God. We're all sinners this morning. Filthy, rotten sinners. We failed. We, like the thief, deserve death. We deserve to spend eternity in hell. We deserve the reward for our deeds. A lot of people come to church because they want God to get them out of trouble. This thief wasn't trying to get out of trouble. He wasn't trying to get out of having to pay. He said, God, I know what I've done. I know what I deserve. This thief was asking for mercy. You know, there's a difference. Some people come to church and just say, God, would you get me out of trouble? Will you just, will you just take, me, take care of me right now? I'm in, I, I, I'm in trouble. And this thief said, God, I, I know what I deserve. He said, I'm getting what I deserve here on earth. He said, but I know what's coming in eternity. Jesus never delivered this thief from the cross. You realize today God may not deliver you from what you deserve on this earth. You deserve to pay and we deserve what we get. We made the decision. But God can deliver you from an eternity in hell. That's the difference. Some people come to get what they can out of God now. And try to get out of what they've had or what's gone on. But this thief said, God, I know who I am. I know what I've done and I know what I deserve. I believe the Lord can answer that because it's humility. This other thief said, If thou be the Christ, deliver thyself and us. Notice he didn't say, Jesus, you didn't deserve it. Take care of yourself. He said, No, take care of yourself and bring me with you. You know why? He wasn't going to get off the cross and be thankful. He was going to go back and do whatever he was doing. He was just sorry he got caught. He wasn't, he wasn't sorry for sin. He didn't want to have an eternity in heaven. He just was sorry he got caught. Amen. I believe for God to hear us, we have to recognize what sin is to God. 
Jesus was paying for sin, dying for sin on the cross. Amen. Lost people have to come to a realization that they're sinners and, they, and what we deserve is hell. But Christians also need to come to that realization too. You may be delivered from hell this morning, but if you want to get God's attention to answer your request, then you need to realize you're still a sinner and you still deserve hell. But by God's grace, He saved us. Amen. It keeps us humble. It keeps us in front of God's eyes realizing that, God, we still don't deserve, but we are thankful. See, but God hates pride. Pride is an abomination, God says. Why would God bless you for pride? Listen, realize who you are in God's sight to keep you humble. Because if you get too prideful, the Bible says that God will not answer. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not answer. When you keep sin and you get prideful, God will turn a deaf ear till you get it right. Listen to me. Some wonder, why can't I get a hold of God? Why, can't, why won't God answer? Let me ask you, have you had your humble pie today? Amen. Realize who you are and what you do deserve. Amen. What else do we need to get a hold of God? Look at the thief here. He said, And we indeed justly, in verse 41, For we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And, Jesus said, or, and he said unto Jesus, Lord. I believe this thief recognized who God was. See, before God's going to answer you, you're going to have to realize not only who you are, but you're going to have to put faith in who God is. Yes. That God can answer. See, the other thief just said, if you'll be, if you're God. The other thief said, no, Lord, you are God. Would you please answer? See, the difference between a prayer's answered in a Christian's life is whether you say, God can. Now, Lord, would you please hear me? And others that say, well, if you're really God, if you really can answer, why don't you take care of this? The difference between a lost person and a saved person is when they say, well, God, if you could, I'm not convinced yet. And a saved person that kneels at an old-fashioned altar and says, Lord, I'm a sinner. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Amen. That's what makes the difference. I believe that Jesus was so stirred by this thief, he turned and gave him his attention. Because that thief recognized that Jesus had done nothing wrong. That Jesus was the innocent Lamb of God paying for the sin of the world. You want to know why the Mormons don't get their prayers answered? Because they don't believe that Jesus is the innocent Lamb of God. You don't want to know why there are those that pray to everything else but God, never hear from God. Because they don't recognize who Jesus really is. You want to know why there are uh, reservations that turn to trees and turn to grass and turn to everything else but God? Because they never hear from God. You know why? They've not realized who God is. Right. Right. And so they'll turn to everything else. Mm -hmm. But it's because we have to get back to realizing that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And only through Jesus can your sins be forgiven. Right. Only through Jesus. That thief had to realize that Jesus, it's only you. You're paying for my sin. And he watched the God of heaven die for him. He said, Lord, just all I ask is that you remember me. How many of you this morning remember a time when you realized that, that God, thank you for dying for me. Please save me. Give me a home in heaven. Boy, what a joyful time that is when a sinner realizes who they are and who God is says, Jesus, I need you. That's what got God's attention. See, the other thief didn't care. Who cares who he is? I just, want, I just want to get out of this. The other thief said, God, I know who you are. And I know what you're doing. Can you please save me? And God was willing to turn and say, today. Immediately, his request was answered. Today. Amen. God can save you. 
today. I mean, God's not going to wait till next week. God's not going to wait till, well, if you live for me, then maybe I'll think about it. No, amen. God says, today you'll be saved, amen. God just wants to see the faith that you have. Boy, I love the thief on the cross because he bamboozles every other doctrine on the face of the earth. That's right. Amen. Because the thief of the cross never did one thing for God. Never spent one day in church. Never gave one dime to God. Never did anything for God. But Jesus said, today I'll see you in paradise. Amen. Amen. You may never get baptized, but you can be in heaven. You may never join a local church. You may never give God one dime of your money. But Jesus wants to take you to heaven today. What a blessing. Amen. I love this thief. Because he said, he, he's going to be in heaven with you one day, standing next to you. And he's going to stand beside Paul, who wrote half the Bible. But he's going to be just as forgiven. Because it's by faith. Realize who God is. The last thing I believe, look here in our text. He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The thief was stirred in faith about who God is that he was willing to ask. The Bible says, ask and ye shall receive. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Last thing you need to get a hold of God's attention is just by faith, ask. Christian, you have a prayer request today. If you neglect your time in prayer... God knows what you need, but God still says to ask. You want God to answer? Get on your knees. Ask God. The, the, the Lord Jesus answered him as soon as he said, remember me. Amen. God wants you to ask this morning. Maybe you're not saved this morning. The only thing stopping you from being saved and having a home in heaven is just coming down to an old-fashioned altar and placing that faith and trust in Jesus and asking for that gift of eternal life. It's absolutely free. And it's the same for a Christian. God says we have needs. The only thing that stops us from getting what we need is taking that faith in prayer and asking God, God, would you please provide? And I love when Jesus turned. He said, I say unto thee. Notice he only talked to the one thief. He said, I say unto thee. He wanted the other thief to know, I'm not going to answer pride. But I'll answer you. God wants to answer you this morning, but pride will stop it. Pride will be that barrier. It will never reach God. Till you're willing to humble yourself before the God of heaven and ask. Put that faith and trust in God. What's stopping you this morning? Amen. Lost person, what stops you? from getting saved this morning, from getting 100% sure that if you died today, you'd spend eternity in heaven with Jesus, just come forward. Put that faith and trust in Jesus at the invitation time. Let me show you from God's Word how you can trust Christ. But also, Christian, we need to come down to an old-fashioned altar. And I believe the altar's good. You know why? Because we can kneel. Keeps us humble. And kneel. Say, God, I know who I am. I know who you are. But it also helps you, but I believe it helps your family. Yes. My dad always, I remember, every week would take me down and kneel at an altar. You know what that helped me learn as a young man? I remember. Listen, I, I know. I, I remember. I'm just not here because dad drugged me to church, amen. I'm here because my dad helped teach me and instill in me a love for God. Amen. And that started with him coming down. And, he, and he's talked to me before. And he said, son, now I'm not perfect. But God is. And we would pray and get a hold of God. And that would keep me humble. Ever since then, made it a practice. Kneel before God. And say, God, I'm sorry. But I need you today. And I hope that my little girl will see her daddy kneel at an altar. And one day put it together and say, you know what, I need Jesus too. And I hope she'll live the rest of her life being willing to kneel before God. Amen. God wants to answer. Are you trying to get God's attention today? Well, you can. 
Amen? If we follow these things, I believe we can get God's attention today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord.